God's time. Come on, church, this morning. What time is it? God's time. Glory, glory. Welcome to Rainbow Valley Church, where we would like you to feel needed, wanted, valued, and most importantly, know that there is a divine call on your life, not for yourself. Say, not for myself. Not for myself. But for God. From God, for God, from God, for God, from God, for God. Without further ado, what we'll do first is release the Kids, have fun! I might call them.
constant revival for six weeks now. As in new people are showing up, new people are reaching out, people are starting to realize that the world does not have the right answers. That it comes through Jesus first, and through Jesus the answers will follow. Amen? Amen. So the pool party was awesome, buddy. All he wanted was no presents, which he got a ton of them. Thank you all that participated and was able to come and bless my son with all the crap that I'm going to end up stepping on and throwing away anyway, praise God. But it was a great success. All he really wanted was kids to come to his birthday party, and there was about, I don't know, 10 or plus kids. It was a really good time. We had a blast. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Some that aren't here today were there then. And what time is it? God's time. So just because you're not here today, I'm not talking to you individually. I'm kind of talking to all of you. But the point is, just because you're not here today doesn't mean things don't happen. I understand life sucks. But if you're the one saying life sucks, life sucks, life sucks, grab you some Jesus and let's go in the movement of courage. Can we? Leadership meeting was yesterday. It was a great success. The pastor had to put on a different mask than I've ever worn. I've always been a nice kissy kissy. What time is it? Everything's great, wonderful, everything's cool. And yesterday we laid down some things. It's a parable of a speaker system. You get a brand new stereo system, there's lots of parts. You gotta put them in position, and the instructions clearly say, do not tighten down the screws yet. That's the last thing you're gonna do. So recently, as of two years, we've been moving speakers, setting them up, stretching cord, putting the receivers here, doing this, laying the groundwork. Yesterday we tightened some screws, and I wanna thank my leadership at Rainbow Valley Church. It was a blessing to have all those folks show up and show out. Not for me, not for your mama, not for your daddies, not for your bosses, not for your parents. Who you show out and show up. They showed up and showed out for Jesus. Bottom line, and I just thank you guys for all of that. Brother Keith, he started the prayer meeting at Rainbow Valley Church, and he's doing okay, but he's got COVID and he's in the hospital. Those two combinations, not good. Pray for him, please, for sure. Ladies game night, if you're a lady, you need to show up because they got lots of stuff planned. That's this Friday, starting at 6. Saturday men meeting, I'm going to eat a whole bunch of pork. Right, David? That's right. A whole bunch of pork, and either I'm going to eat it to my neck alone, or you all need to show up and come eat it with us. Praise God, so Pastor, don't Carson and causing cancer as for bacon. No, anyway, I refuse to praise God. We got rid of the cancer. The cancer's gone. And Amen. I People are being saved. Do you know what's number one in life? Just to run this down the checklist for everybody in here. Who's number one? God. I said, Jesus! That's right. You're all right. Number one is Jesus. God. Number one. So if you're not putting him number one, then your life's probably going to suck in some manner, some form, some fashion, in some way. That's the way it works. What's number two? Anybody else? Family. Your direct family, those that you live with, the ones that are around you constantly, the ones that you have influence over. You all are my family. But I have a family, little Donnie, little Buddy, little Dominic, little Abby, little Athena. My daughter Amy is married and off on her own. She is outside of the construct of that family. It's my job. Jesus! Family. And then what's next? Church. Church. That's what the biblical format is. If your life does not line up in those three things, then I'm just going to guess, maybe throw out some, some wonder, maybe. Uh, does your life suck some way? It's probably because the construct isn't following Jesus, family, church. Those need to be our priorities in life. And I'm preaching from the pulpit, therefore I'm in line with those priorities. Amen? Just so you know, that's how I feel. Next Saturday, women's meeting. So we're having back-to-back -back women's meeting. How is that even fair? That's not fair. The first one is game night. Can I get an amen? That's not amen, fair. that's not fair. Amen. And the second one is like ministry. Women's <laughs> rights are getting out of hand. Yeah, what? <laughs> my, wife, my wife says you can either be right or you can be happy. Pick one, <laughs> not more. <laughs> God, we'll just move on from there. Prayer, we're going to start our prayer meeting because we know it's rough for you to come all the way out. we got people that live clear out in Tonopah. we got people that live in Arlington. we got people that live in Phoenix. we got got people that live in... Mesa, we got people that live all over the place. So instead of having you go away for six or seven hours and then drive all the way back, by next week we're going to set up a Zoom prayer meeting. So you can jump on there, you can be a part of it, Pastor can see your name on there. I said, he was there. Even if you log back off, praise God, at least you can join in, hear some of the prayers, and pray with us. 
Prayer is powerful. That's how God hears us. And do you know that you can speak and be in communion with Jesus Christ at all times? Oh, Lord, we give you the glory right now for everything that you're doing in our life. Good, bad, sad, and different, glorious, all the victories, Father, we give you the glory for everything. For you're guiding us, you're leading us, and you're directing us and you're teaching us. You're cleansing us and you're making us a new creature in Christ daily as we walk in Jesus' name. Father, we give you the glory for this church. We give you the glory for all the worldly possessions we have. We give you the glory for the friends and the family and all the sorrows and troubles. We give you all the glory. Lord, anoint my mouth to speak to your people clearly so they would be touched, they would be prophesied to, they would be healed, Father. Whatever they would need, they would get it. In Jesus' name we all say, Amen. Amen. That's praying to the Lord, praise God. You can do that every minute of the day. If you're worried, pray. If you're concerned, pray. If you want to cuss out your neighbor, praise God, pray. If you get mad at one of those snowbirds because they're driving like a crazy, pray. If you need anything, you pray. And it's simply speaking to God. It's not like, oh, dear Heavenly Father, I've got this 17 words I need to say and this and that. And I'm not knocking it if that's the way you do it. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be this structured program. God isn't about religion. He's about relation. Amen? And this is all free for you guys so far. So we need unity in this church. We're looking for like-minded people. People that are crazy. Because you know your pastor's just nuts, right? And I don't know that I'm nuts, so I think I actually am. Like I thought I was, and I'm probably not. Anyway, point is military standards, correct? Point is, is that we're looking for like-minded people that want to get involved. The last update we have is the building. We are this close to getting permits. It's going to cost a heck of a lot more money, like $12,000 more money, just to get the paperwork so we can build our building. But we're this close, and we're moving forward. Step by step, inch by inch, everything is going to be a cinch. Who's going to pray? Tim, you got a loud voice on you? No. <laughs> He's all not happening. David, stand up and pray over the offering this morning. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do for us and all that you've done and all that you continue to do. We ask that you bless this collection that we have here. We ask that you bless our uh, missionaries. Um, and we ask that you put a generous uh, tone over everybody's heart, Lord. And I know it's not easy to split with your money, but just give us the strength to do it. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys know my heart, and I doubt any one of you have ever heard me ask about prayer, uh, about money, about asking or giving, because I'm not the type that's not in my spirit. This is your church. This is your body. This is your building that's going to be built. This RBC is for the community, and we need help, not financially. Speaking of the church, we're going to be working on the 20th and the 21st of September, putting a new roof on the wall or Amen. on the building over there. If everything goes in a line, those are the days we need to just show up and show out for Jesus. Whether you can come and work or whether you're just going to come and stand. We don't mind whatever. We're going to have water. We'll have toilets. We'll have everything on scene. We'll have a construction crew with the cranes. It's going to be a wonderful day. By September 20th, 21st, we're going to have a new roof. One inspection by the county, and then we're going to have asphalt shingles on it. One more inspection, we're going to have electrical and HVAC air conditioning, praise the Lord. And then we're going to have the floor put in. Then we're going to have the, the, what do we call that, Betty Jean, the drop zone, the fly zone, the fall zone? Oh, no. the, uh, uh, landing the landing pad. Landing we're going to put enough carpet in there to where the Holy Ghost hits you and you fall out. You don't crack your head open on the shiny floor. You get some nice cushiony carpet. The church building should be done very quick. One lady asked me, saying, well, isn't the church building and where we go have church like every week? No, this is a house. This is a parsonage in which the Lord has provided for the season at hand. We're all in different seasons. And let me tell you, that church building is going to be done very soon, and we've been waiting a long, long time for long it. Time. But in that time, it wasn't the devil stopping us. It wasn't anybody particular stopping us. You know who was slowing it down? It's not us and it's not the devil. Who's left? God was slowing us down to bring us all into different maturity levels to teach us a new thing. Because I was loud. You think I'm loud now? I was really excited two years ago when I got to be the pastor and I had no clue what that entailed. What was going to happen, what went on, I had no clue on the experiences in the last two years. We would get and be allowed to go through to learn. So it's always what time? God's time. One more time. It's always God's time. Always God's time. Today, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Corinthians. First Corinthians. David, I'm glad you asked. The title.
title would be called Courage. What's the title say down there at the bottom? I don't know. Courage? No, you have a good guess. <laughs> <laughs> there, I don't think there is one. There is. Grab some courage and let's get going. If that's probably close, I don't remember exactly what it says. You need to be watching on Facebook to say it. But we need to grab some courage and get going. Courage is not the fact that we're not afraid, uh, allowed to be afraid. It's not the fact that things aren't going to happen. When you become a Christian, I'm here to promise you that the devil, yourself, everything in the world will throw stumbling blocks at you and get you off of your divine call from God. We need courage. 1 Corinthians 16 and 13. Be on your guard, stand firm in faith, be courageous and be strong. I need to be, how's that song go? I need to be courageous, right? We all seen it 10 years ago, that song. We need to be courageous and not afraid of fear. We've got to get outside of our box of uh, what's going to happen. I think every one of us, if not all of us, have in one point in time been afraid or worried or concerned about our future, correct? Uh, or maybe that's where you find yourself right now. What's going to happen later? What's going to happen to this person I care about? What's going to happen with my finances? What's going to happen when they cut my whole bottom lip off? What's going to happen? Are they going to have to cut my neck out? What's going to happen if she feels this way? I'd say who cares? One more time, church. Who cares? cares? What other people think? First of all, none of them and their opinions matter about you. It's God's opinion that matters. But everybody in this room has been in a position to where we have need to grab some courage. Everybody in here has been afraid, anxious, worried, concerned at some point, whether it be in your past or your future presently, about what is going to happen. Those experiences suck. And you might find yourself, see when I read my notes you can tell everything goes back down. Perhaps there is such an experience like that in your past, or maybe it's where you find yourself at this very moment. Perhaps concerned is not the best word to describe this matter. Possibly words like extremely concerned, or worried, afraid, or even downright scared would better describe on how we feel. Panic, panic washes over you like a flood, like the monsoon weather we had last week. We couldn't come to church because the parking lot was drenched. There was water everywhere, and the Holy Ghost said, just don't have everybody drive that far this week. But the panic washes over you in a concerned manner to where you are worried about what's next. David, right? But all of a sudden, Amen. God came through, did he not? Yes. Yeah. What time? God's God. time. He always comes through because we don't live in our own time. We live in God's time. It's his time frame. And if you're doing the scale, Jesus, family, church, then he will always come through. His timing is perfect. We might not be ready for it all to be over. There might be something you need to learn, how to be quiet sometimes, how to stand still, how to let God control things. There might be some stuff that needs to happen. You might need to be matured a little bit, and that's why you're being allowed to go through the things we're going through, correct? Amen. You wake up in the wee hours of the morning, and this dreadful feeling of panic almost makes you nauseous. And I'm telling you, in the last seven months, those have been the most intimate times that I spoke to Jesus Christ. In the wee hours of the morning, waking up in panic and sheer, being just terrified in my sleep. The devil's controlling it. And then I would remember just to speak to Jesus and cast out all those worries and thoughts and concerns and complaints and cuss words. And just be like, Lord, talk to me. And he would talk to me. Take away the flood of fear. Because he said, you need to be courageous. If you stand in me, what else can come against you? What weapon form can come against you if you got the armor of God on? And then you start communing with him, speaking, fellowshipping. And he'll speak to you like he's your best friend. An adverse situation or condition has touched your life. What are you going to do? What can you do? It's a very serious matter. You don't understand, Pastor, how serious this is. It has been forced on me. And how am I going to manage this? Your mind begins to create mental pictures that bring you even more concern. The worst case scenario starts coming at you. Maybe it's something that's been ongoing for a while. And you start to wonder, when will this end? How will this end? Will it ever end? It could be in such an adverse situation that will require a miracle to correct. Do we 
not know that God is in the miracle working business? I'm working up sweat. Can't feel that, so the better you guys do it, that y'all right up there, I'll tell you, okay? All right. Let me tell you guys, if you're in that position today, if you're concerned or worried about anything currently, you're not alone. There's probably 50% of the people in this room that are concerned or worried or upset about something. You're not alone. If you have experienced any of these emotions, you're not alone. Thousands of people, just like you and me, have traveled down this road or are currently kicking rocks right down that road at this moment. To make it through these turbulent, tr turbulent, turbulent times, thank you, Dave. These troubled <laughs> waters, you need a special ingredient. You all know what that ingredient is? Jesus. Now we've been on it all morning. Courage! You need some courage. What is courage? Blake, I'm glad you asked. The dictionary defines courage as a quality of mind or spirit enabling one to meet danger or opposition with fearlessness. Now, I don't entirely agree with that definition. To be fearless means to be devoid of fear, to not be afraid. And let me tell you this, many of us display courage while experiencing a degree of fear. There was multiple different times in the last seven months where I was definitely afraid of what could or might happen. And there was multiple times where I would let it pan out and go, well, what if this happens? And, oh, my God, if that happens, Lord, what if this? And if that happens, then, oh, my God, then we're all back to zero. We're not hero. We are done. Afraid. But that's when you pick up some courage. Mm -hmm. Norman Vincent Peale described courage as strength to do what is right. Integrity. I preached about that months ago. Integrity. You have to do what's right even though it might feel wrong or it's going to put you back a couple steps. You have to do what is right. Courage is the strength to do what is right regardless of the consequences. That's a good definition. Here's mine. Courage is not the absence of fear but the capacity to put one foot in front of the other and move forward. An inch by inch in Jesus Christ makes everything the same. You can take a shed that has a ton of stuff in it lift it off the ground and put it in the back of a truck with a bunch of two by four and two people. It's possible. Inch by inch, you can do everything and it becomes a cinch. Fear. I think without expectation, everyone experiences some type of fear. Is everybody with me? Amen. Everybody experiences fear. And if you're saying no, shaking your head, you're lying. You're in church. Lightning could strike. Calm down. Quit lying. Everybody experiences fear, whether you're good at masking it, hallelujah, or not. Whether you can tell I'm afraid or not, because I seem like I've got my stuff together and I'm a good leader. Some of you know that I've been afraid the last seven months. But do you know today the captain has been set free? Amen. The bondage has been broken. Thank we God. are running in Jesus Christ full bore, afraid of nothing. Now, when my daughter had a little episode this weekend, Fear set in again. Fear struck my household. I was afraid. That's where I called the police because I was afraid. Ambulances. My daughter was being prayed on. That moment where the fear hit me, my wife prayed, and whatever was going on stopped instantaneously. In Jesus' name, it was done. As in when the ambulance got there, they didn't know what was wrong, her blood pressure was low, but everything was okay. While I was in fear, I had someone next to me that understood the power of God. When she is in fear, I'm the one that steps up and understands the power of God. That's why family, side note, and unity, and church, and God is also important. Because if you have someone to call that will understand to pull you back out of the fear and bring some a big old plate of steak and, and courage to you, it makes life easier. Fear. Because you're wearing a mask don't mean that it won't crack eventually. The mask will crack and fall off, and then it'll be too late, and you'll be just, it's, there's lots of suicide and depression and all kinds of things going on in this world because they didn't understand that they could reach out to family and friends. And that the number one important is that there's a power of God. <coughs> Fear. We need some courageousness. We need people to be courageous. Everybody goes through some type of fear, dread, apprehension in the life of what they're living at some
some point. Certainly some of us more than others, but just as certainly everyone. Say everyone. Everyone. The world feels that if you're a Christian, then you shouldn't be afraid. Because you have guilt or fear or worry or apprehension. You can feel like God has made you a new creation. That's okay to feel worried and afraid and be in fear. Just because you have the power of God doesn't mean you forget it every once in a while and reach out and call the ambulance. And you probably should have prayed to begin with. But everybody experiences fear. We know that the word of God tells us plainly that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. power. Everybody say power. 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 If you're afraid or you're worried or you're anxious, you're in a moment in your life where all you can do is be caught in fear. You need to hear those words rattle off of your bones. Power. That's what we need to walk in. That's in which we need to live in. That's which we need to speak. Power is what the spirit of God gives us. Not giving us the spirit of fear. Not giving us the spirit of fear. But of power and of love and of sound mind. You will find that in 2 Timothy verses 1 and 7. And I believe it. I try to live it. I try to walk it. I try to be an example of it. Don't be afraid. It doesn't matter what happens next. If you got God number one, family number two, church number three, then it does not matter what happens next because it's going to be the will of God. Amen? Amen. God has not given us a spirit of fear, fear, but we feel it from time to time just the same. So where does the fear come from? Some people have all kinds of fear, but we are only born with two types of fear. Did you guys know that? As babies, they only have two types of fear. The fear of falling, which is amazing to me because as Grandma Dorothy got older, she would like start to fall when she really wasn't falling, and she was definitely afraid of it. And the other fear is loud noises. So when you rah, make a loud noise, and, and Steve half asleep, and, and I wake him up, that's a fear that we're naturally born with. Not that Steve, that Steve. No, this Steve. No, Everything else we pick up along the way. Isn't that amazing? Everything that you're afraid of, you picked up as an adult and chose to grab a hold of. And either we can learn to let it go to Jesus, or we hold on to it. There's some fears right now in this room that I'd like you to think about giving back to God. You weren't born with them. You don't deserve to live with them. And he wants them back. They're not yours. That's good. Those fears are irrelevant in the eyes of God. And if Jesus is number one, there's no need to have it. Amen? Amen. I felt that one, Steve. That fear is God. But the good news is, whether you're a bestseller of fear or besought with fear, worry and strong anxiety, we can overcome it by the power of God and the authority that he has given us. And in the process, we have a sound mind to continue on. What do you do next? I don't know what to do. I'm afraid of what's going to happen in the future. I'm a worry. I'm afraid. I'm a concern. I'm a this. I'm a that. Listen to God. You probably already know what's next. You already probably seen what needs to happen. And sometimes it's hard to actually follow through with what God is telling us to do. Right? We read in the Bible there are several, several different places God has instructed his people not to be afraid. Why did God say that? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because his people were afraid. That's why God says that very simple. So if you can't tell me that just because you're a Christian, you can walk boldly because there will be times where we're afraid or concerned or worried. You need to replace it with courage. Courage. Be courageous this morning knowing that God stands with you. He stands for you. Yes. As long as you put him first. The Bible doesn't ever say it any other way. He has to be number one in your life. Amen. In fact, if your life sucks in any fashion, any manner, any way, any form, any concern, any, 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 then it's probably because God's not firmly placed in his throne in your life. That's a big deal there. It's been on my heart. If we're worrying, it's probably because we're not thinking about God first. And I do it. I'm not perfect. Guilty. Everybody say guilty. Guilty. And God, I'm in a room full of sinners. Praise Jesus. The only humans that were not worried or afraid was Jesus. Wait! Wasn't there that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying to God and he's like, please, Lord, take this cup away from my lips if it be your will. But if it be your will, then I'll go ahead and 
stream, allows him to stream me up on a cross for all. Wasn't there that time when Jesus Christ asked God to take the cup of pain away yep. from his lips? That sounds like a little concern to me. Maybe even a little worry. He's the son of God, has all authority and power over heaven. Yet he just kind of simply said the words, take this cup away from my lips if you would. But quickly to follow up, if it your will, then I'll do it. The mighty man of Elijah, one of God's great prophets, a man of power, authority, very, 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 very powerful man. I mean, he was able to call fire down from heaven to wipe out Baal's prophets. Anybody recently called fire down from heaven? No, I mean, he was a mighty God. And he ran. Some lady threatened him, and he, I mean, he got a message from a lady and sent him running for his life, the Bible says. Elijah. Even Elijah got afraid. Jesus got afraid. It's okay to be afraid, but it's a matter of what we do with it next. We stand up and do what's right. Even if the consequences are horrible. A part of the prayer that Jesus said is, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But with courage, he continued on in praying and said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. Because he faced fear and conquered it. That means we can do it too. Because as a believer, the Bible says that we'll do greater things than Jesus. Greater. He says, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit for you to be filled with so that you can do greater than I do. That's why I got to go. That could have concerned people if you didn't know your Bible. Jesus said, you're going to do greater. Even you can do greater miracles than Christ did himself. Doesn't that blow your mind? Mm -hmm. That means we should not be afraid. We should not have any fear in our hearts. And when it comes, we should dispatch it as quick as it starts to flow. <laughs> he now dwells within you. <laughs> you dear children are from God and overcome those fears because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world, the Bible says. Our world today sucks. Nobody's got to tell me that politics is jacked up. Nobody's got to tell me that corruption runs deep in the veins of a lot of men out there in this world. The world is horrible. My wife hates that word when I say it sucks. But it does. I mean, there's no better way to say it than it sucks. Sucks. Life sucks. Don't worry, I want to get everybody to say it, though. Okay? It's like a Kirby vacuum, she says. It really is. It's good. It costs a lot of money. It's horrible. The world today, nobody has to tell you that you live in troubled times. Is it the end times? I don't know. The Bible says that's not for any man to know. Not even the angels will know. Just live right. Put God first. Put your family second. And put, like, if your wife, you're second to Jesus. Wouldn't you rather be second to Jesus than anything else? Amen. 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 Jesus, family, church. Nobody has to tell you that we live in troubled times. A variety of diseases and viruses are running rampant throughout the world. The economy seems to be teetering, teetering on the edge of recession. The price of a gallon of gasoline, my God, my God, continues to rise. Anybody that drove across the country in the last three weeks knows that. It's huge. Some places it's like $2.30, but other places it's darn near $4 to $5 a gallon. Thank God we didn't go to California. The housing market continues its downward slide. People are facing various financial situations. There are physical problems, mental problems. Men think they're women. Women think they're men. We're giving children the, the, the right to decide what sex. I mean, the world sucks right now. That's why there's never been an ever clearer time. We need to stand firm, get some courage, and be present beacons of light for Jesus Christ. Then the time is now. There are many people dying and going to hell waiting on us to stand up and do what's right. That's rough. But the world is going to hell in a handbasket. That's why the time is now to do what is right. Put yourself to the side. Put your needs and your concerns and your worries to the side. Help somebody. And helping others, you will be helped. Domestic and serious family problems, as if all that was enough. The world is turning against each other to race. It's getting bad. And just because you're a Christian, it does not keep you protected 
from the effects. I was thinking of that song. Little eyes, be careful what your eyes. Careful little eyes, what you see. <laughs> Sorry, that's a bad song. <laughs> be careful little eyes, what you see. So what you look at, what you listen to, what you concern yourself with, where you fall into the enemy's traps, where you get distracted. Be careful little ears, what you hear. <laughs> we need to stay focused. And if you're afraid to stay focused, because some of us just sit in the grave. We don't want to succeed, so we don't fail. So you just stay stagnant and do nothing. It is better that we work hard and fail a bunch and succeed and get one motorhome sell out of 182,000 no's than just to sit there and don't do anything. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. People find themselves in a mess. Some are almost defeated. Obstacles loom in their pathway. Some feel totally stuck in a quagmire and not knowing or going anywhere. When these things of this nature hit, does it not have to? It does not have to mean that someone has sinned. <coughs> you know, people are like we're doing altar call. And they're like, oh, that's Sister Hall. She's going up there again. But she was doing whatever she's doing that week. It doesn't mean you have to sin when you go to the altar to Jesus. Just because you have problems in your life, concerns, and worries, doesn't mean you're backslidden. So quit judging, because the Bible says if you're judging, then you're judged for the same very act. Amen. When you look at those people in school and you're like, mm -hmm, that one, you might as well have done what you just judged. It's a really sticky trap. It's like the snake that goes in the, the trap and then goes right back around and sticks itself where it's like a handle in the boot trap. And you think it's a, a handle and it's actually a snake. Okay? I did it. It doesn't mean you've sinned. It does not have to mean that there is some kind of wrongdoing. It can simply be that some unfavorable circumstance has overtaken and altered the way of life. Still others are on the verge of victory and success on the verge of victory, but somehow they never get off of the verge. Is anybody stuck on the verge of success? I'm tired of being on the verge. I want to be successful in the Lord. I'm done being on the, it's about to happen any moment now. We're just waiting for it. No, we need it to happen now. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen. You can have a definite call on your life from God and still hit that area of the road of life where your wheels just keep on spinning. Where we're like, Lord, please show me some kind of motion, some kind of forward progress. Wheels are spinning in life to suck. But if you are putting Jesus number one, then you will get some traction eventually. Amen. Whether it be an inch, you'll be able to see it. Lord, let me see some type of divine miracle happening because I just feel like the wheels are spinning. I need to grab some traction. I need to know what to do. And if I'm doing what I think you're wanting me to do, show me that it's what you want me to do. Show me that I've got some rubber on the pavement. Others just sit neutral, not going anywhere. They are content in their complacency. They're stuck in their woes, their sorrows, their concerns, their cusses, and they're fine with it. Unacceptable. God does not want you stuck in any neutral position. The Bible says you might as well just be a sinner than be neutral to God. That's rough. That's preaching. Many times this happens because people let their fear of failure stop them. But this is not just limited to ministry. Regardless of your spiritual vocation or walk with God, you must face and deal with many adverse situations. Sometimes it's just called life. Just because you're a Christian does not mean it's going to be easy, Joe. Dare to be brave. President Franklin Roosevelt once said, Fear greater Far greater it is to dare to do many things, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor souls that live in a gray twilight and know neither victory nor defeat. There is no guarantee in life, Christian or not. We need to fully embrace the word of God. And God said, not your husband or wife said. God said, not your kids said. 
God said, and not your pastor said, but God said he would not let more come upon us than we can bear. He won't let anything happen to you that's going to break you. If it's happening, then you can bear it. And that with every situation, every problem, great or small, he will make a way to escape. That we might be able to bear it. We forget the last part. We always see Jesus as candy corn and Skittles and leprechauns and rainbows. Rainbow Valley Church. Leprechauns and Skittles and great fun. Unicorns. dogs and different nice things. Unicorns. Unicorns. I get those right The scripture says that we get to bear it. And it's just going to happen. We'd like to forget that part of the scripture. Thinking that he's not going to let us go through anything that we can handle. No, anything that you can bear. He's not going to yank you up out of situations. He's going to allow you to go through situations that are going to teach us, direct us, cleanse us. Not going to just yank you up out of the mess of the situation, but he did say he would get us out of the process. He would help us endure until we get out. What a promise we have. That means that no matter the situation, there's hope. Say hope. 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 If you're, you get upset at your pastor correcting you or trying to direct you, then you need to get more closer to Jesus. Because there's always hope. And my mindset is hope. When I say something that's not contrary to what you're saying or feeling, it's because I've talked to the Lord and it's just the way that I'm really supposed to be saying it. There's hope for you. There's hope for you, Jimmy. There's hope for you. You know, you feed his every week. <laughs> we have a promise, you guys. There's hope. For each one of us, courage means finding the spiritual and mental determination to endure. The mental determination to endure. You might be spiritually sound and you can pray for everybody else. You listen to God and talk to God, but your mindset needs to be strong. You need to get courage and maybe your mindset in order to endure the discomfort and to recognize that everything, absolutely everything is subject under God's control. Once again, if you're going through it, and you have God at number one, then it's probably something that he, no way, it's not probably. He is allowing you to go through it for a reason. The disciples were told to get into the boat and go to the other side. Halfway across the, the lake, the storm hit like craziness. They all got afraid, worried, freaked out. He didn't say get in the boat, get halfway there, and when the storm hits, give up your hope, jump out and swim for shore. Stay in the boat. There's hope. Prayer. That's your weapon. It's a powerful weapon. It's a mighty tool for us to use whenever we need it. It's called prayer. It's called talking to God as he, he's your friend. When you text your friend and you talk to them, that's as easy as it is. It's easier because you don't even have to use your finger to stand up. Yep, that's as easy as it is. I'm just holding my eyes, talking to God. Yep. And did you know when you speak out loud, the devil can hear you? So you're like, Lord, I pray that my left toe quits hurting. Praise God. You're opening up invites for the devil to come mess with you. You need to be like, mm -hmm. and that's why speaking in tongues is important because it's a prayer language that the devil doesn't understand. That's why people do it. Now, some people just get up and okay, moving on. Even though the individual just, that's just acting spiritual. That makes no sense to me. But the holy language, the speaking in tongues, just so you know, some of us know, that is so the devil don't understand what you're praying. Hmm. Or just shut your mouth and pray in your head. The devil can't hear that either. Can't read your thoughts. Even though individuals that Jesus himself chose as his closest companions and disciples were often afraid, unaware of themselves, lacking in confidence, they sometimes faltered and failed. You guys know you're the disciples of Christ? If you believe in Jesus this morning, then you should be a disciple of Christ, as in you're learning from him constantly. And how are you going to learn from him if you don't talk to him? How are you going to learn from him if he's not your head, he's not your leader? If you don't commune with Christ or have a relationship with him, then how are we 
we supposed to be disciples of Christ? And then I'd ask you, who's your disciple? If you're really with Jesus, then you should be having a couple of disciples in your back pocket. You should be telling people about Jesus. That's what our Great Commission is all about. Telling people about Jesus. So if your life sucks this morning, then I would just readjust your priorities and put Jesus as number one. And just give it a shot. Just like the, what's that road game called, Jimmy? Didn't work, praise God. But just give it a shot. It's <laughs> worth it. Give it a shot. Jimmy's like that. <laughs> After Jesus was resurrected from the grave, he sent the Holy Spirit to be a friend and a guide uh, to this team. There was a source of power and encouragement. That's why the Holy Spirit is here. That's why, quick story. And remember, I had two of them, Miss, Miss BJ, to tell. Spent four days in the car with her. And we were both, probably both done with each other by the end of it. Because we're different spectrums of people. One day in the, in the store, and she says, I don't know which one you should tell. Real quick, we prayed, Lord, split the seas. Take that storm and take it away because we're 40 foot of transit vehicle, moving truck, and a car behind us on a trailer. Split the seas. I said, he ain't going to split the seas. It's a strong look at it. It's huge. It's not. We're going to go right through that thing. And sure enough, miracle, as soon as we get there, storm. So I'm like, how did the storm just split apart and just stop? So that was the, like, that's with the water, right? That one's cool enough. But here's some tricky stuff. We're in the store. There's two lines, and it's a big, like, rest stop. And there's, like, two cash registers, and they're good, you know, far away from each other. There's a little blonde lady and then another man over here. And they're doing their two lines, and then she says, I don't know about that line. Like, you might want to get in it or don't go in it. She said something to the effect of the line, and I wasn't listening. I was just looking at my recent pieces, my, my bedtime snack, trying to figure out which one I wanted. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got you. And she says, I'm out of here. And she walks out, and I'm like, what, where is she going? She stands outside the door, and she's looking in, and I'm like, what is she doing out there? Why is she not coming into the store? Praise God, this is weird. She, but anyway, that's her, praise Jesus. So she's standing out there looking in, and then all of a sudden, this big man, truck driver, if you can just imagine a big, brawling man, bigger than anybody in this room, bigger than Jason even, but he had like his belly hanging out, and he was bald. And he was like Arabic. I don't know exactly what his culture was, but he didn't speak very good English. And he looked angry, red-eyed, because he's a truck driver. So he's been driving all night, and all he's got is a cup of coffee, right? And he comes from the line that I did not get into, and that dissipated in the time frame in which I'm standing in line. There's a black man in front of me, another man behind me of another culture I don't know. But my point is, is there was many cultures under one creed, all in this area. And she had mentioned something about something's going to happen and I don't want anything to do with it. And she left, right? So she's standing out there and I'm like trying to put together what I heard her say compared to what I thought she said. And I'm like, nope, nothing's going to happen. And then all of a sudden this man starts screaming at the little blonde lady. What? I was in line. I was in line. Hold on. And he goes, hold on. He's speaking in language and English broken. And he's getting very angry. And I'm like, what's going on out there? And I touched the gentleman in front of me and said, hey, what's going on? And he goes, I don't know. She won't sell him his coffee. And she's saying, you weren't in line, sir. You need to go to the back. And this line's kid, he's long now. You need to go to the back of that line. And he's like, I was standing in that line over there for the whole time for the last 10 minutes. You guys need more cash. And he was just going off. Well, then this other man came over and said, um, I got it. And told the other lady to go over there. And he's like, sir, you got to go to the back of the line. And we're all thinking, that works. you are too small to tell <laughs> this giant man to go to the back of the line. So I looked at the guy and I said, hey, can he go before her? And he's like, yes. And I tapped him and said, are you okay with him getting his coffee? That's all he wants. Yes. I said, excuse me. Excuse me. He's got to go to the back of the line. And I'm like, yes, but we're the line and we're saying you go ahead and check him out. It's okay, peace. Everything's good. Everything's good. Point is, is that she knew it was going to crack off. And it was cracking off. And we're all sitting there, and then the man's yelling, and they're yelling back and forth, and we're not understanding why he just won't ring up his cup of coffee. And I said, okay, since we're spouting our own opinion, the Lord would not be blessed. And I got my Jesus is kind of important shirt on. The Lord would not be impressed by what's going on here. <laughs> just give this truck driver his coffee. He's probably delivering your meat or something. Praise God. And let him go because he's angry. The Lord would have us engage the situation and the man in front of laughing at me, the man in the back is. And then they still argued. I said, okay, reach out and touch the Lord. You want me to keep 
singing. When he passes by, like making a total scene out of myself, praise God for the Lord. And then everybody started laughing. There's a thing called the Holy Spirit that leads and guides you. He told me to sing. Even though I was kind of afraid of the giant angry man, I did not know what the two in the front and the back were going to be thinking. I don't know what the little lady over there that was doing nothing, obviously, at this time. Make another line because there's ten people behind me. She's outside going, because all you can hear is the yelling and the cussing and the complaining. And then she starts hearing me singing. Point is, is there's a Holy Spirit and the whole situation was engaged. Everybody started smiling. The man at the counter finally rang up Dude's Cop and he made him walk over to the line. And then we all agreed, can he be in the front? Yes, he's going to be in the front. It's not too late to touch him as he goes by. And he goes, oh, oh, come here, sir. He rings him up and he left. And I go outside and she's like, what happened? And I start telling her, she's like, okay, that's too much energy. It is too late at night. I'm going to bed. Shut up. Anyway, point is the Holy Spirit led the whole situation. She wouldn't want her to be in there because of her concerns. I was the perfect one to be in there. She put me in the right line to deal with the situation based on the power of God. If you need something this afternoon, if you need something next week, if you need something this very moment, learn to put Jesus Christ first. If you put him first, your problems will dissolve. Like one of them bats did. And it's almost as cool to watch it happen. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. As a part of a family of God, you have promises that you can stand on. How many of us can quote a promise right now? I know a few of us can, but some of us walk around in life impotent, impotent, not feeling important, not feeling valued, not feeling anything because you don't know any of God's promises. This book is full of promises. I got two. No, I'm just kidding. One's my wife. The book is full of promises that we need to live on. And one of them is that the Holy Spirit leads and guides us and empowers us to be courageous. It's getting hot in here. In conclusion, everybody round of applause. In conclusion, courage is knowing when to hang on or to let go. Giving up on an unrealistic idea or expectation, not clinging to those things unless God has revealed it to you. So we all have great ideas and grandeur. We all come up with wonderful things. We need to learn how to let go of some of those things and focus up on Jesus Christ number one. Amen? Amen. Standing up, even if you have to stand alone. I've done that in the last seven months, but I was never alone because I had my family, my church family, and my and, and God. My family, my church family, and God. I didn't have to stand alone. Going through, you may get weary, resisting peer pressure, fighting back, stepping out on faith and trusting in a divine source to help you. That is what courage is, and that is all you have to do. Yes. That is all you have to do. Father, right now we're going to ask you just to come back into our lives. This morning it's hot in here, Lord, and we give you the glory. The cracker barrel is waiting. Not for me, because I don't like their fish. <laughs> but your people have come and gathered this morning, Father. And we're going to bless Facebook, David, and we're going to shut them down. Bless Facebook. Everybody say, bless Facebook. Bless, bless Facebook. Facebook. In Jesus' name.